For a narcissistic person, the only feedback that they can hear is, this was the best. You are so awesome. Wow, there's never been anything better ever. You are like a living saint amongst us. Amazing. You're so amazing. That's all they want to hear. Narcissism and related personality patterns reflect a problem with regulation, with not being able to soothe oneself internally without having to turn to something outside of them, outside of you, if this is how you suspect you go through life and go through the world. And that could be anything from drugs and alcohol to shopping to needing people to tell you you are great or being available to you whenever you want and getting angry at them when they won't be available to you. Now, in a healthy person, and, and it this sort of pattern being healthy is often a byproduct of healthy attachment experiences in childhood. In a healthy person, a healthy person can soothe themselves, whether by self-talk, breathing, or turning to other people in an appropriate manner. And by appropriate, I mean things like waiting for your next therapy appointment instead of contacting the therapist 20 times with non-emergency messages before your session, or sending someone 20 texts in the middle of the night, or asking a friend if they can talk it out at exactly the time they're not available and getting mad at them. That's not healthy. Now, we all have moments when we may need something to take the edge off, but healthy means that more often than not, you can manage your highs, manage your lows, and feel confident that you are able to manage all of them. So in a dysregulated pattern like narcissism, using things outside of yourself to regulate is commonplace. And this is where this issue of validation seeking, which is such a signature element of narcissism, comes in. At a superficial level, it's easy to view validation seeking as a person who is bragging and arrogant and posturing. And, and it looks like that, and in part it is that, but there's something much, much bigger. The validation is something a narcissistic person needs. It's how they keep the feelings of insecurity and inadequacy at bay. Listen, not in anybody's life can every day be a good day. On some days, there are bills to pay and you may not have enough money for them. There may be bad news from work, broken dishwashers, relationship problems, or even just straight up boredom. We deal. But alas, narcissistic folks don't deal. The validation seeking is something that helps people manage when they are reminded that they're just a regular person. And people are narcissistic, don't like being reminded they're regular people. If you have to deal with disappointments and frustrations, well, then you aren't very special, are you? Or at least that's how it can feel. So seeking out validation, whether on social media or having or owning stuff that gets you validation, that could be money or a car or a job or a fancy house or an attractive partner, all of that can help a person regulate self-esteem and the sense of inadequacy that so many people with narcissistic personalities have. Listen, narcissism is an outside job. And what I mean by that is that the narcissistic person is fully reliant on the outside world for everything. They have to turn to the outside world to figure out what a great person is supposed to be, what good goals are supposed to be. And people who are narcissistic turn to the outside world to tell them that they're okay or that they're great. Frankly, it's a terrible and exhausting way to live. It's like having to rely on the outside world for your most fundamental needs like food and water and air. And when the world isn't available or gives confusing messages or you live to please the world, then obviously a person can never find or be their true selves. And being a narcissist is forever living in the false self or at least the self that is in service to the world. Validation seeking behavior is so central to the psychology of narcissistic people because it is in essence how they regulate. As long as the world is telling me that I'm great, 
then I'm great. As long as I get likes and followers, then I'm great. It gives the narcissistic person a sort of suit of armor, a protection against the inadequacy that's bubbling up. And then it becomes a habit. Basically, the narcissistic person is constantly seeking reassurance. But to everyone else, it doesn't look like reassurance seeking. It looks like the narcissistic person bragging and living their best life, quite frankly. In this way, for example, narcissistic folks have a very complicated relationship with social media, something I've talked about in another series on this channel. They love it because it is such an efficient way to get validation, and they hate it because they need it. This pattern is interesting because it actually does work for the narcissistic person. It gets them the thing they need so they can regulate their self-esteem and regulate their identity and keep those feelings of inadequacy pushed down. But it gets really off-putting for everybody else. Other people get really annoyed by the constant bragging and other people also get exhausted feeling that they always have to keep bringing narcissistic supply and praising the narcissistic person. It wears other people out because it leaves a relationship feeling like a one-way street or basically a relationship that only works if they are your fan club. Now, please drop a comment if you can identify how this pattern has played out in your own life. If you believe you have narcissistic tendencies, what strategies have you used in order to receive validation from other people? Or if you have someone who has narcissistic tendencies in your life, what have they done to try to get validation from you or from other people? It'll be interesting to see all the different kinds of validation seeking techniques there are out there. So if you think you are a narcissist, what do you do about this pattern, this habit, this need for validation? Number one, it's going to be hard. Consider a social media fast or break or limits. While it's not the only way a person seeks validation, it's one of the more common. By cutting it out, you then will need to find better and more internal ways of regulating. It's like taking all of the sweets out of your kitchen if you are trying to eat healthier. It's a really good start, but you still need to find a way to get through those moments you want the sweets. And also, as sort of a side, line, a side element to this, also stop looking at other people's social media. That is part of this sort of social media fast because it just whets your appetite to want to look for validation for yourself. Number two, start developing new ways of regulating that involve only you. Exercise, walking, breathing, meditating, mindfulness, reading, walking your dog, even watching TV. Ideally, watching something that may change your mindset and perspective. And most importantly, all of these things that don't require other people to validate or reassure you. Number three, practice listening. And this is in every video in the series, I'm saying this. Validation seekers often hijack and dominate conversations and talk about themselves. Listen to other people talk and give them reinforcement and feedback that is helpful. Learning the other half of the dance that other people have been doing for you can be a useful lesson and create more balance in how you have conversations going forward. Basically, what I'm saying is turn that one-way street of a conversation with you into a two-way street. Number four, you got to seek out therapy. It will be uncomfortable to cut back on the validation seeking. So seeking out therapy as a place to talk about how it feels to not seek out or not maybe even get the validation can really feel vulnerable but it's really important work to get to the core of this dynamic. And for those of you watching, how about you do some of my job for me here? Can you think of other recommendations for cutting back on validation seeking? As always, use that comment, that comment section as sort of another living, breathing part of this video and let us know. 
A common criticism of narcissistic people is, why is everything always about them? The answer to that is because the narcissistic person feels it has to be about them. So they feel heard and validated and regulated. But it's a pattern that has to be addressed if a person is to break these cycles and have a fighting chance of developing healthier relationship. In an ideal world with a narcissistic person, you don't engage. But I recognize that this is not always an option for most of us. So where do you begin? Let's start with the first thing you should not say to a narcissist. Let's start with, if you don't mind, I just want to give you some feedback. I know some of you are like, oh, no, no, that's not going to work. No, it's not going to work. Narcissistic people don't want your feedback. Whether you have power over them, whether you have no power over them, whether they're in power over you, or you're in a relationship with them, I promise you, they don't want their feedback. They may even say they do. They don't. Feedback is such a nice word, isn't it? And it's the idea that you might be getting information about yourself that you can implement. You could get feedback on a school assignment, feedback on your work performance, feedback on a meal you prepared, feedback on, I don't know, a vacation you planned. None of us like bad feedback, and rarely in life is feedback all good. If you're lucky, at the end of your life, you can hope that 50% of the feedback you received was good. I think then you'd probably be running about average. Now, the minute a narcissistic person hears the word feedback, they actually hear the word criticism. And if you lead with a, if you don't mind, then they know the feedback is not going to be glowing and necessarily positive and they know what's coming. For a narcissistic person, the only feedback that they can hear is, this was the best. You are so awesome. Wow, there's never been anything better ever. You are like a living saint amongst us. Amazing. You're so amazing. That's all they want to hear. Feedback that may be things like, hey, you wrote a good paper, but it was a little long, or you're doing great work, but I noticed that you aren't always accounting for other people's feelings and how you do the meetings, or I know you have so much to say, but I just need you to be aware you're interrupting people. We're not getting to hear from them. Or things like, you've been such a help with the children, and boy, do they love their playtime. On school nights, so we do need to ensure they get their baths and dinner before 9 p.m. You say those things to a narcissistic person. They're going to hear those pieces of feedback as, hey, you're really verbose. You don't know how to write. You're a big old unempathic meanie. You interrupt everyone and you're a jerk. You never help with the children and you're a terrible parent. That's what they're going to hear, even though you didn't say that. And because they hear it that way, they go into a rage despite how well you give the feedback. How dare you tell me that I can't write? How dare you tell me that I'm mean or that I'm a jerk? How dare you tell me I'm a bad parent? And then you say, but I never said that. I just said that the paper was a little long or we just needed to ensure that some of those people were heard in the meeting or you're a great parent. Mm, they don't hear that first part. As soon as they hear the less than good part, it's as though you never said the good part. And there's research that supports this, that narcissistic people are much more likely to attend to and react more quickly to negative words than to positive ones. Remember, there's a sort of persecutory mindset. They feel like they're being persecuted, that everyone is out to get them and harm them. So that anything you say to them that's not perfect, they lash out at. Now, everyone thinks, and all of those business books and communication books out there, unfortunately, they don't always build in narcissism and how they teach people to communicate. All those books make this mistake. They all say, well, lead with the props, lead with the compliments first, and then you can give them the other information. It doesn't work. You give a narcissist feedback they don't want to hear, you're always going to get raged at. Now, some of you may not care and may feel like you can handle the narcissistic person's rage. And now that you know nothing will soften it, you may just go all in and give the feedback and not even try to give the soft entry, right? 
Some of you may feel silenced, and this is where the eggshell walking that's a part of all narcissistic relationships come in and just say nothing or figure out the workarounds or just do it yourself. Some of you may fluff and fawn to survive. It's not pleasant. It feels inauthentic and uncomfortable, but you recognize there's no way I can give this person anything but good feedback. The hypersensitivity of narcissism and their incapacity to receive feedback in an open manner, the shame activation and the subsequent rage, it all makes any form of feedback all but impossible. If someone like this works for you and you give them feedback, just set a timer and just wait for it, the grievances and the lawsuits. If someone like this is your, your partner, either roll up your sleeves for the rage whenever you give feedback or you do it all yourself and ask for nothing and still have to prepare to be disappointed. If this is your parent, you know it's always been this way and it's always been their way or the highway. And if you can't give feedback, let's face it, a relationship simply can't grow. It, it remains forever stunted. And that's narcissism, isn't it? Forever stunted. Relationships that don't grow, that don't mature, and that don't feel safe. So either just give them the feedback, just give the narcissistic people the feedback and deal with the fallout, or don't give them the feedback and recognize that things will never change. But don't give them a prelude and tell them like, hey, just wanna let you know, I'm gonna give you a little feedback. The minute you say that, their shame sets in and they're incapable of hearing all you say. So file that under things not to say to a narcissist. And you might have thought, boy, have I made that mistake many times. Lots of people do because it's an innocuous phrase. But as soon as they think anything's going to come up that will activate their feelings of inadequacy or shame, you better believe that you're about to get your head, your hand snapped off. Listen, if something bad happens to any of us, it feels deeply unfair, it feels damaging, it feels harmful, and we struggle with it, it feels unjust. And then if we open that up a little more and we recognize that life hasn't been fair to us, I don't know, maybe we look at our lives and say, maybe we didn't get the financial support that would have made a difference in our lives. Maybe we didn't get the emotional support that would have made a difference in our lives. Whatever it may be, it's very easy to fall into a sort of self-victimized thinking and talking. This idea that life isn't fair to me. If only this had happened to me, or only that had happened to me. Because the problem is, if you do that, then you live in that place of regret and rumination. It's simply not good for us to get stuck in these thought loops. It strips us of our sense of agency, or the sense we can do something to help ourselves. And it keeps us stuck in the past rather than saying, hey, nothing on this adventure called life is fair, and it's going to be even less fair if I keep letting this sense of injustice keep holding me back. Now, in people who have narcissistic personalities, they chronically, and I mean chronically, feel that life has been uniquely unfair to them, even when it's actually been disproportionately lucky in some cases. The nature of the narcissistic personality is to chronically perceive threats and this belief that people are actually out to get them or they maintain this consistent entitlement to be treated better, that they deserve more, that they deserve this, that they deserve that. It means this chronic mindset of life is never fair to me. Life is, everyone in life has it better than me. Nobody is ever nice to me, even though I'm so good to everyone. It's a constant sense of why me? Why do all these bad things only happen to me when I'm so nice to everyone? I remember talking for a while to a person who was clearly very narcissistic. This was a person who was born to a rather wealthy family. They had tremendous means. His education was fully paid for. He could explore any dream he wanted. He was given a car when he turned 16. He was given apartments to live in and his rent was always paid. And his parents paid at least $300,000 on his various rehab stays. He ended up marrying a beautiful woman. He ended up having beautiful children. And this man constantly, I mean constantly complained about how life is so unfair to him. Everyone is so mean to him. Why does that person have a better beach house? Everyone uses me for my stuff. Honestly, I wish I was as victimized as this guy, right? 
So this narcissistically victimized mentality, frankly, it's exhausting for other people to listen to, especially if all the rest of us are carrying the same burdens or worse. Now, when I work with narcissistic clients, we do get to the point where I say to them, why is it that you think you deserve justice and fairness more than anyone else? Now, sometimes that's the day they drop out of therapy. And sometimes in the clients with narcissistic personalities who are actually trying to do the work, those clients will say, no, I guess you're right. I guess I'm no more entitled to that than anyone else. And at that point, I know we've got a shot at maybe getting somewhere. Because that's what all of this comes down to. Life is not fair. In fact, it is so deeply unfair and unjust that it actually defies logic. Luck is just about everything. And then if you throw some hard work on top of that luck, then frankly, the sky is the limit. Hard work without luck, that's a really tough path. But for narcissistic people, they do believe that they are entitled to justice and fairness, but they don't concern themselves with whether everyone else is. But above all that, they feel they're the ones who are entitled to it. And they will rage against the world and those closest to them and will even blame them for this perceived injustice and unfairness. It is painful to come to this awareness of how deeply unfair life is. Some people are born into families with loving, attentive, kind, and available parents. And some, many, are not. Some are instead horribly abused and neglected and mistreated. Some people are born into money or privilege. Many are not. And they may watch their families scrape by and be treated badly by the world for being a sort of have not. Some people are born smart or athletic or with a certain skill or appearance, while others may come into the world with something that may limit them a little bit more intellectually, physically, or in some other way. All of this is unfair, and there are no magical karmic scales in the sky that make it all right. We have to play the hand that we are dealt. Some people are literally born as lottery winners. The rest of us, we keep playing the numbers and have to make the most of life, even if those numbers don't hit. None of it's fair. Narcissist, not narcissist, doesn't matter. The work of being a human being is to get our head around that and play that hand that we were dealt. And that is very difficult for people with narcissistic personalities. This dynamic of victimhood is most pronounced in the vulnerable narcissistic style. It is one of the key covert manifestations of this style. The constant, oh, woe is me. Nobody's able to see how great I really am because I'm just not appreciated. I didn't have a trust fund. If I had had that, my life would be easier. My parents treated me badly or my parents didn't treat me badly enough or my parents spoiled me or my parents didn't spoil me enough. Nothing goes my way. I shouldn't have to get an entry level job. I shouldn't have to hand my paper in by the deadline mentality. The idea that life is unfair and unjust to the narcissistic person, it doesn't fit well with the thought process of grandiosity and entitlement and perception of specialness that narcissistic people have. So instead of trying, there is a greater likelihood of falling back into the idea that I should be too good to have to try because I'm great. Things should just come my way. Because after all, I'm me, and I'm entitled to it. Not so much. Now, the victimhood, this, this, this stance of victimhood, leaves other people in the position of feeling that they often need to rescue the narcissistic person, reassure them, and leave them feeling that everything will be okay. And people will often spend countless hours trying to show the narcissistic person all the great things in their lives so they will stop with the self-victimization 
And that is exhausting for the other people around the narcissistic person because it's hard for other people to do it if you're not getting it back. If they're doing it for the narcissistic person, the narcissistic person usually isn't doing it for them. Now, if, you're, if you think you're narcissistic, does this mean that you have to suck it up and never get to speak about your pain? Not at all. But when you talk about it, talk about it as feelings. Take ownership. Recognize how this way of thinking is holding you back. Be kind to yourself and let go of the shame that you may have about bad things happening to you. Bring all of that out in the light. All of us have the right to speak about our pain and it should, but to break out of that cycle of using that kind of thinking as a way to get out of having to take responsibility and take ownership of your life and to break the cycle of blaming other people. So if you suspect, if you think you're narcissistic and you think you have a real propensity to victimhood, what should you do? Number one, say it, say it, write it, meditate into it, breathe it. However you have to get what I'm about to say into you, life is inherently unfair to everyone, just about everyone. So that means an existential choice to keep on keeping on despite this. This life is unfair thing isn't a persecution of just you. It's something most of us grapple with because the unfair part may not be your responsibility, but the ability to get up and do what you can instead of falling back into it, that's your responsibility and it's a gift to yourself. Otherwise, the concept of unfairness actually wins because you spend your whole lifetime grousing about how everything is unfair and never really live your life. Number two, you got to grieve it. It sucks. It sucks to come from an unhappy or an abusive family. It sucks to not have enough money. It sucks to have opportunities slip away or not come around in the first place. All of this is terrible and it hurts and it's real. And these losses and these hurts, they need to be grieved. Be angry. Be sad. Let the emotions happen to you, but recognize them as grief. And when you can let the feelings flow, then you may get to the other side instead of always fighting these feelings and always being mad at the world. Number three, please stop thinking that you are the exception to the rule. This exceptionalism is a real hallmark of narcissism and it really gets people stuck. And being stuck obviously isn't good. None of us should be the exception. Now, some people may end up becoming the exception and that's maybe that luck, but none of us is really an exception. Try and find some comfort in the collective idea in that. Now, this can fly in the face of the narcissistic need to be special. All of us are special. All of us aren't special. It all comes down to your point of view, but it's not just you. Number four, remember that other people are going through stuff too. Sometimes a lot more stuff than you. Assume that. If you work from that assumption, it can actually leave the world feeling less threatening, less unfair, and more like a place where lots of other people who are just like you are just trying to get through. Don't assume that everyone is having an easier ride than you. Some are, of course there are, but, for, for, but not all are having an easier ride. In fact, many probably aren't. Now, number five, as a shrink, I get to see into the private lives of many people. And let me tell you this, rich or poor, beautiful or homely, educated or not, big job or no job, any race, any nationality, any political persuasion, people actually have much worse backstories than you think. Lots more people than you know had bad childhoods, terrible experiences, horrible sacrifices, and the danger in the narcissistic personality is to write the story as though everyone else has it better or easier. I am telling you this as someone who really gets to be sort of an explorer of other people's lives, not of places, like I said, but of people. There is so much pain and loss and difficulty in people's lives than you could ever imagine. Try that thought on and find the empathy in that. Number six, 
people don't want to keep reassuring you. They don't want to keep reassuring you or me or anyone. It's time you learn to reassure yourself. Harness that victimhood into other emotions that may motivate you to give stuff and the stuff of life and the work of life a real shot. At least if you try, then at the end of your life, you can say, listen, I gave it a shot, which is a far less bitter pill to swallow than the idea that life was never fair to me. Number seven, instead of asking why me, ask why not? Shit happens, good and bad. Although this is a little bit more of a positive than the usual Dr. Romney stuff I put out there, if I might ask you, for one month, keep a little record in your phone each day of one good thing that happened to you. I don't know what those could be. You got praised at a meeting. A dinner you cooked turned out well. An old friend called out of the blue. Uh, someone let you go ahead of them in the supermarket line. Gratitude actually can be cultivated. And it is a real hedge against feelings of victimhood. If you suspect that you're narcissistic, and if you can break this cycle of victimhood, you actually will feel that life is actually a little more fair, even if lots of bad stuff happened to you. That instead of excusing not trying, that you actually try, and even if it doesn't go the way you want, there's always some health in the actual process of trying. It's called efficacy, and it's good for you. A major antidote to narcissistic personality styles and the patterns associated with narcissism are to just take responsibility and stop blaming other people. Initially, it can feel really uncomfortable, but can break you out of these victimized cycles that not only hold you back, but harm the people around you. If you really do think you're narcissistic and want to push back on it, then take some of this in and please give it a try. I promise you that even if you try one or two of these things and they work, it will really go a long way to help you help yourself feel better about your place in the world and less angry at the other people in it. Now, I recently had the pleasure of reading a 2015 academic article written by Krizan and Johar from Iowa State University, and the article was on narcissistic rage. It was a really great paper that broke down narcissistic rage and the different ways it shows based on whether a person is more of a grandiose narcissist or a vulnerable narcissist. But the Authors did a nice job of also shedding light on something that is really worth talking about on this channel called the shame rage spiral. Their manuscript, and they were talking about other people's research too, it brings up a quote from a famous theorist who studied narcissism named Heinz Kohut. And he wrote, the need for revenge, for righting a wrong, for undoing a hurt by whatever means and a deeply anchored unrelenting compulsion in the pursuit of all these aims are the characteristic features of narcissistic rage in all its forms. So it's a fancy way of saying it, but Koha and many other authors point out basically that if you question a narcissist's reality, they will punch back, which is really interesting because one of their primary maneuvers is to question your reality and gaslight you. Now remember, the narcissist has to construct a false self and an egocentric sense of reality to protect their rather broken, confused, and variable sense of self and self-esteem. So, they get really angry if you poke at their grandiose or victimized sense of self. And they get really defensive, rageful, and mean. And all that's the stuff I talk about on the Narcissistic Rage video if you want to check that out. So let's talk about the shame-rage cycle. Theorists such as Lewis, who write about shame and mental health in general, have very much described this cycle in a much more scientific, well-articulated way. Basically, when a narcissist gets activated, perhaps someone questions them, or does better than them, or asks for a little more from them, or just simply holds the narcissist accountable. The narcissist experiences two things, kind of in order, shame and then rage. The rage is a manifestation of vindictiveness, retaliation, punishment, 
in essence wanting their perceived perpetrator to feel as bad as them. So let's talk about shame. Narcissists are not the only ones who feel shame. We all do. It's a universal emotional state. Shame is a sort of public emotion based on the idea that we will be seen and then subsequently rejected or discarded for our shortcomings, our deficits, our vulnerabilities, and that the uncomfortable parts of ourselves will be exposed to the world. And that's really uncomfortable. And when we don't process our shame, some of which we carry from early childhood, it turns into negative emotional states that can plague us throughout our lives. Negative emotions such as depression, anxiety, hostility, and these are, these appear to be, when they appear, we get triggered, or they get triggered by a shame-inducing event. And why does that happen? Because we're afraid our deficiencies will be seen. Shame harms us from the outside in and the inside out. So narcissists get into a real cycle of anger when their shame is triggered, which actually works well for them. Because at that moment when they're like, Ugh, I'm not dealing with this, they aren't having to grapple with the really horrible internal feelings that shame evokes. Instead, what they do is instead of dealing with the feelings, they just get angry at the person who evoked the shame, whether the other person intended to do so or not. And then they blame the other person and project feelings onto that person, or they just fully discard them. They want to get ahead of being discarded themselves now that their shame is public. Now, other researchers such as Roark have pointed out that shame doesn't just elicit rage, it can also elicit a passive aggressive response, especially in covert narcissists. And this can then devolve into the narcissist ruminating about their plan to finally punish or dominate or control the person who called them out or triggered their shame. So whether it's traditional old fashioned in your face rage or the passive aggressive, sullen, resentful, brooding, obsessive rage, the re reaction is rage. So then over time, as that does turn more and more into rage, the narcissistic person then chronically starts to rage at people who evoke their feelings of shame. Now rage isn't good and people don't judge rageful people well. It's not a good look. So now the narcissist gets stuck in a cycle of feeling shame, lashing out with rage, feeling more shame as a result, lashing out with more rage and you can see how that escalates. Most of the narcissist rage has a shame-based origin, and in this way, the entire world can feel like one big shame-inducing threat for narcissists. Thus, they have their grandiosity, their defensiveness, their entitlement. All of these are their suits of armor that protect those narcissists from shame, but they're not always going to work. So the short story is the narcissist fear of being found out means that they are at constant risk of shame. Inevitably, the shame gets triggered, boom, and then they rage. And this is why so many people get stuck in the eggshell walking cycle around narcissists. Nobody wants to trigger them, but most people aren't clear that the thing that you're actually trying to avoid triggering is the shame, because that's what leads to the rage. It makes it all but impossible to have a healthy relationship with the narcissist because you never know what's going to trigger their shame and it may be something that has nothing to do with you. They just take it out on you. They may get triggered because it may happen because you didn't notice that they did something around the house. It may happen because you reject a second helping of something they cooked. It may happen because you get a promotion and they don't. It may happen because you called them out on a lie that they told. It may happen because you caught them watching porn. It may happen because they aren't able to change a child's diaper. It may happen because they didn't get into the college they wanted or the job they wanted. It may happen because their brother bought a bigger house than them. It may happen because they didn't make their sales quota. It may happen because not enough people like their Instagram post. It may happen because they saw their friend was sharing a new success on social media. It may happen because someone insulted them. So as you can see, 
All of these are experiences that may reveal the vulnerabilities or deficiencies of the narcissist to the world, and those are the kinds of things that trigger the shame cycle. So you can also see how shame sets off rage, sets off shame, sets off rage. So without understanding it, most people in these relationships live in confusion, walk on the proverbial eggshells, and hope to goodness that things go okay. But that would only work if you're the only person in the narcissist's life. The narcissistic person likely goes to work, or goes to the store, or is on social media, or goes to a social gathering, and something might happen there. And then, when they get back to you, they just spread that rage towards you, because they need a target. Now, when experiences occur in the narcissist's life that uncover their deficiencies, the cycle is typically then to rage at other people, blame other people, become vindictive towards other people, and then feel more shame when people push back on their bad behavior for generally being a raging jerk. So what are you supposed to do if you're in a relationship with a narcissist? Honestly, not much. As a therapist, I get to work with clients who are narcissistic as well as clients who have experienced narcissistic abuse. I must say that the work of shame is the hardest work of all with a narcissistic individual to let them know that they are just as solid a person with or without the promotion or the better car or even if they told a lie. My work then becomes to teach them the appropriate ways of addressing those moments without raging at people. And it's a tough battle because the shame sequence gets activated so quickly when a narcissist perceives that they're going to get found out. Maybe some of you are, but in general with your loved ones, you aren't their therapist to the narcissist in your life. So it's not your role to do this. And listen carefully, and even if you did, it wouldn't work. And the narcissist may rage at you even more and treat you with even more contempt for trying to soothe them. Again, the shame gets activated. This shame rage cycle is why sometimes narcissists will come around with apologies after going on a rage bender. They want to erase it in a way. And if you don't accept their apology, voila, the cycle starts again because their vulnerability was made public. The shame rage cycle is why so often these relationships are almost impossible to fix. The kind of therapy the narcissist requires is hard work, requires long-term commitment, a very skilled therapist, and regular therapy for a very long time. These things are not available to most people, and most narcissists are very contemptuous of therapy. Anyhow, when the therapist really starts going in deep, that's often when they drop out. So perhaps if you understand this cycle though, it's my hope that you won't personalize the shame rage cycle. There isn't much you can do. There's actually, to me, something quite tragic about this dynamic. That fear, that paralyzing fear of what would happen if someone really saw your faults being such a destabilizing space. And compassion in these spaces can get very tricky. As many of you know, I'm a big believer in balancing on that razor's edge of compassion and self-preservation. And it's a really tough spot with the narcissistic people in your life, especially because in your compassion, you want to be there for someone and not contribute to their cycle of shame. But to be a punching bag for their rage helps no one and is actually very bad for your health. This all brings up larger societal issues of why don't we work with families and especially with parents and also with healthcare providers and educators to help people learn to just be okay with themselves, faults and all. Listen carefully again, shame has no place in a child's life. And for both narcissists who likely were shamed for not being good enough as kids and for their victims who were also shamed for not being good enough as kids, we can see how this cycle puts into place this whole system almost of oppression and victimization of these narcissists who rage and of people who endure the rage. And on both sides it's happening because of early messages of not being good enough and of shame. 
Oh, listen, I can't change that tide by myself. It's a societal shift that, frankly, I have to believe will, have to take, will take many generations to happen, if it ever can. But in your life now, right now, if you're stuck in a rage cycle with a narcissist, at a minimum, I hope this sheds some light on it, lifts some of the blame off of you, and encourages you, need, encourages you to seek out the help you need to process this, and lifts the burden of responsibility to be the one who fixes this problem off of your shoulders. The narcissist themselves can and must seek out help to end this cycle. You can't do it for them. So I do hope this illuminates some of this. And also, to give you another example, think of the shame cycle, the, the shame rage cycle. You know where it often manifests? Social media posts. Ever see that happen? Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, insult, 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 back and forth. They get into rages. They get into fights. They get into all kinds of shouting matches on social media. That's a great example of the shame rage cycle. Someone says something, maybe they don't like the narcissist post or the narcissist makes a comment and people kind of say, that's not okay. The shame gets activated, why? Because social media is a public space. And then that narcissist escalates, escalates, escalates. Many of you have seen this happen where a narcissist may actually in some cases lose their career, lose, lose a lot of things because they can't stop themselves in these spaces. They tend to often take their rage to social media. They tend to take their rage to Yelp. They tend to take their rage to these places where they can be angry at people. Then people shame them. You've seen this cycle before. So this shame rage cycle plays out in lots of places, individual relationships, families, and in public stages like social media. So I hope this has answered any questions or at least maybe even illuminated you to this shame rage cycle. If you like this and I, you learned something, please give me that like, give me that little validation. Thank you again for tuning in and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.